Okay. Starting therapy. That's right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you everyone for joining us at the Horace's extraordinary meeting to mark the UN school at 75 milestone in the midst of a World War III like all encompassing crisis. Our session will focus on everywhere entrepreneurship, whose premise is that the world needs many more job creators than job seekers, something that is, I think, easier wished than accomplished. Our quest is to spawn and foster resilient enterprises as jobs and income generating engines, especially for women's economic empowerment, poverty eradication and wealth creation, and most of all, for sustainable development goal achievement, which is vital for developing countries and youth abundant countries like India. The pandemic triggered great disruption and tech 4.0 Schumpeterian gale of creative destruction in the future of work, economy and society presents opportunities and challenges for what I call the triple wins of entrepreneurship, employment and women's and youth empowerment. We therefore need governments private sector and civil society to work concertedly to bridge the gender gap in full and productive employment, decent work and sustainable entrepreneurship. We must also use the COVID related tectonic shifts to adapt and leapfrog into post COVID-19 jobs and entrepreneurship rich economic renaissance for all. The work and entrepreneurship landscape for women was already challenging before COVID-19 and was made worse by the pandemic. In India, barely 24% of women are in the work formal workforce and the rest in informal sector as low-paid, precarious, unprotected workers. Pandemic-related re job losses are disproportionately higher for women some 1.8 times with 60% income losses, pushing millions into extreme poverty. Women-owned enterprises in India, for example, account for 20%, globally 30%, and provide direct employment to some 27 million people. So how can we increase their share in the overall uh, job market? and also an, an entrepreneurial uh, force, and how can they be made job force multipliers? Women's, uh, women owned enterprises have the highest share of micro enterprises, small enterprises and very few medium and large ones. So how can we overcome the size and scale uh, glass ceiling? and bridge the financial and digital literacy and business skills gap. How can we boost another major entrepreneurship jobs metric, which is women's self-help groups, certainly, and in India, this is big. Six million providing livelihood to 67 million women in rural and urban India. So as in work, women entrepreneurs are disadvantaged by leaking pipelines, unpaid care work burden, glass ceilings and sectoral glass walls, and unfavorable social norms and business practices, I want to emphasize. And scope issues include value chain climbing in entrepreneurship, what they make, sell, trade, for how much value, profit, as well as limited in terms of their form, type, systems of enterprise, and technology adoption and sophistication. So I will ask our panelists here, we have a brilliant set of panelists to provide us ideas on what and how of women entrepreneurs progressing from precariously self-employed small entities to empowered generations of large scale jobs, a large scale job generating uh, uh, quality jobs 
for women, men, and youth? What kind of nurturing and shockproofing ecosystems, and I want to emphasize both in these times, are required on demand and supply side, financing, incentives, business and technology skills, some of you are going to address that, tools, institutions, labor standards, new regulations, social networks, gender equal corporate culture, government procurement, all of these constitute these, uh, the, the ecosystem. Which are the sectors at the local, national, and global levels that are most ripe for job-rich entrepreneurship? that mine human skills and talent as much as leverage technology and these include green economy, the care economy. We've really emphasized that uh, in the UN, ICT and AI, some of you are experts on that, social services, creative industries, also the whole universe of COVID response industries and services. So how, then the next uh, question is how to set up a value chain and virtuous cycle of knowledge, education, skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. Now that's become very, very important in the case of the AI digital economy, but also employment for and through dynamic entrepreneurship. Then how to harness technology 4.0 led revolution in supply chains? in agriculture, manufacturing and services, future of work, gig economy, AI enabled, digitized work platforms that have been accelerated by uh, the needs of contactless uh, work uh, in, in COVID-19 and also benefit from jobs and entrepreneurship starts up churning that is going to and is happening. It must not deepen inequalities and that's the big catch and but we are democratizing enabling and equalizing impulse so that is very critical how to remove structural legal discriminatory social norms and attitudinal barriers to risk taking and decision making that hinder both women entrepreneurship but also adaptation to new tech 4.0 environment by all Last but not least, how can everywhere entrepreneurship be unleashed and benefit from the economic mobilization and action by countries towards pandemic related, the three avatars of pandemic related relief and mitigation, recovery and resilience, and building back better and building anew that all countries are undertaking. This is critical to pivot back to achieving SDGs by 2030, which is our North Star, uh, which as UN Secretary General says, the world is careening off track from due to COVID-19 disaster. So our panelists today have diverse and rich experience in actual entrepreneurship creation and fostering and its larger value for sustainable development goals. They will throw some light on these and other aspects from their lived reality and work and provide proof of concept uh, on how we could scale up, replicate the good uh, examples and, and, and disseminate them around the world. And that's one of the purposes of this uh, uh, seminar. So let me begin by asking our, uh, let me introduce the panelists, our distinguished panelists, uh, Rumjum Chatterjee. She is uh, the co-founder of Feedback Infra Group and chairperson of Feedback Foundation that works extensively on community mobilization. Uh, Laura Walker Lee, our second panelist, She's a globally minded strategist who has successfully worked at the intersection of culture and finance and founder of Madra Ventures, Madre Ventures, a fund to provide investment capital and strategic support to enterprises. Madan, Pat, uh, Madan Pat, Pataki, our third panelist, will share, uh, he's, he is the co-founder of Global Alliance 
for mass entrepreneurship gain an alliance that catalyzes all stakeholders to collaborate on igniting a mass entrepreneurship movement which is what also this everyone entrepreneurship is also about everywhere entrepreneurship is all, all about golnar puja and uh, golnar is the um, is a she has specialized in applying strategic growth initiatives via emerging technologies for leading companies such as ibm etc and uh, um, uh, ajayta shah last but not least is the founder of ceo uh, founder and ceo of the award winning startup frontier markets and working on social enterprises and rural india in microfinance rural distribution marketing etc so uh, we now begin our uh, uh, discussion panel discussion with rumjum chatterji and uh, she is going to share her thoughts on bridging the gender gap that i mentioned to mentioned about in entrepreneurial ventures and the need for mentorship to provide sustainability to these ventures rum jum you are how do you uh, rum jum you yeah. i wanted to share with everyone uh, really three examples of uh, the kind of entrepreneurship that we are talking about all of these will actually be focusing on the grassroots level um in 2005 the first example is that of an initiative that was launched um by some of us within the confederation of indian industry uh that wanted to look at women empowerment and we chose to focus on grassroots women and look at the kind of challenges that some of these women have overcome in three sectors we focused on health we focused on education as well as micro enterprise this was uh, begun as i said in 2005 um 10 years later we looked at what we have achieved in terms of recognizing one of uh, you know in each sector across the last 10 years we got these women together and that's when the real journey began for us in cii because that's what led us to this plethora of knowledge and passion that we knew we could unleash which could become a game changer for the way that we look at entrepreneurship we look at grassroots and social development as well as look at the social change that we can bring about uh in the economy um i want to focus only on the sector that we looked at as micro entrepreneurs and since these were all women young uh, entrepreneurs after our experience of dealing with them over a few years i think we realized that we could do much more by giving them a few inputs such as we attached a mentor to each of these women now they were all in the uh, in different districts spread across rural india um, and we were able to identify those resources who could help them build their confidence help them build leadership skills look at how to manage their resources look at providing inputs that could help them um you know create market linkages adopt technology uh, and so on and so forth and in a matter of a few months i think we saw the positive results emerging but the big point was that i think the um what came home to us was that here were women who were finding opportunities amidst adversity we were able to identify those women who in the wrath of poverty were taking control of their own lives and creating this out of their own passion 
of wanting to take charge of their lives and do something that benefits not only them but also the community mm. and there were huge number of positive things that we could uh, get from them humbling experiences all and those we took is for the other people in their communities to emulate so that other women could also then learn from them the second thing that came home to us was here was a seed of an idea in these women that could cause a revolution of change and we could see the kind of change that was coming about with their respective successes not only in their own lives but in their communities and how by showcasing their successes we could bring about change in the social milieu across the country mm-hmm. the third thing that emerged was that with very little input um they were able to move from one micro enterprise to serial entrepreneurship mm. from chicken rearing to very many other things that they could do it was an eye opener for very many and therefore we said we need to not only showcase them but also amplify their voice so in every event that cii organizes whether it is on women empowerment or on social development or on corporate social responsibility we like to showcase these women to come and speak at events so that their voices are amplified their mm-hmm. successes are showcased mm-hmm. and there are opportunities that we get for corporates to be able to link them and their projects to corporate social responsibility initiatives that the corporates are uh, are promoting so this has been today now we are in the uh, 15th year of this initiative it's growing from strength to strength we are seeing the number of people that they are impacting and we are able to showcase and therefore impact very many others uh, by just their uh, success stories being um, you know propagated across uh, different media we are also finding that the community within each of these um, um, uh, environments that that is being impacted is also we are able to engage more we are creating jobs for many more uh, not just women but men as well which is therefore leading us to believe that even if we don't scale in terms of each business if we can replicate these smaller entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ventures in far greater number i think we will together achieve a lot uh, so this is it is um, progressing pretty well the second example that i want to take is about a business connection that we've been able to make from our own uh, industry um we are in the infrastructure industry uh, we are a franchise operation to uh, discoms that are distributing electricity so in the state of orissa which is um, in the eastern part of india where uh, we are we have the mandate to distribute electricity which means going house to house making sure that the connections are there um, meters that need to be read the bills generated and um, the money is collected for each of those bills in one of those four areas that are under our purview we engaged 137 women self help groups to do this activity mm. so results have been astounding mm. not only have they had better success at um, uh you know meeting all the uh, commercial targets we've had a huge impact in uh, bringing down the leakages these women are doing the work in their own communities so access for them is better they are also able to make a social impact and put moral pressure on their own communities to ensure that nobody escapes the whole system and therefore is not paying for electricity or is um you know sort of 
uh, doing things that ought not to be done. This has been a huge success in the state of Orissa. We are now replicating that in the other states. It's got recognized by Ministry of Power and several other things as something that we can do uh, across the nation. What it has also brought about is this huge focus on saying it has improved the lot of women in their own communities. They are now engaging others to come into the fold, which is good for us as well. We have people who are teaching uh, what they have learned to, um, you know, inspire and get more people. So this is the second big success story that um, we are very happy about. And the third that I want to leave you with is, um, again, something that emerged out of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it impacted the elders. Now, um, I work very closely with um, India's largest nonprofit called HelpAge India that focuses on um, the elder population, particularly the marginalized population. And um, as we all know, the pandemic uh, hit the elders very, very severely. What we did with some of the elder self-help groups that we had in many states was that we brought them into a fold and we distributed vegetable seeds to them so that they could get into some kind of small vegetable farming. And with that, they had started this entire thing of not only making sure that they had enough to eat, but were also able to ensure that others in the community could buy from them. So it was a micro, micro enterprise that each one started and is now, I think, going to be on a sustained basis, going to give them a livelihood that is um, good for them. It's giving them the right nutrition as well as making sure that they don't get left behind in society. So I'd like to stop with that. And later, if there are uh, any opportunities to talk about each of them, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you, Rumjum, for those very uh, insightful examples of uh, how to foster serial uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, be they at the and the value of micro enterprises because I don't think one should uh, underrate, uh, underestimate the value of micro enterprises and how to grow them and how to uh, how women are transformers of social change through their empowerment. So all of those points very well taken. Uh, our next speaker is Laura Walker Lee and she's going to be uh, focusing on why. Gender diversity in business is a must for the world economy. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Rajum, for um, you know, giving all those really insightful examples. Um, something that really jumped out to me was that you want to amplify the women's voices. And I have a, a saying in, in what I've been doing, which is that real estate is about location, location, location. But when you have startup companies and founders, it's really all about amplification um, because uh, information has become so flat. Um, with social media and the internet and things like that and in order to carry those companies to some sort of exit event whether it's IPO or an acquisition or something like that people need to know about the company and it has to have some sort of profile um, my background um, is a strange background um, that brings me to this panel um, I have a background in film and television finance uh, I'm doing it for over 10 years and I do the financial modeling and structuring for investors I've worked on Academy Award winning movies, I've worked on terrible movies, I've worked on all, all different kinds of movies. Um, but I, something that I noticed about two or three years ago was that there's a real chasm between the stories that we're telling ourselves and what's actually happening in society. Um, whether it is, you know, um, us celebrating scions of business like Amazon, let's say, um, and uh, maybe there aren't necessarily very good things that are happening for the environment. So people become very noisy about it, and then someone like Jeff Bezos, you know, becomes moved to donate money at that time. Um, and there's now a kind of like this um, uh, back and forth between the public and uh, corporations, um, and there's this direct dialogue that's happening because 
is certainly in America, um, we are in stalemates in our government. And I think corporations are stepping in and they're starting to try to solve social problems. And so I think that um, when it comes to gender parity, it's really essential um, to make sure that uh, boardrooms and management and things like that reflect the actual populations of the world. Um, what I say is, you know, don't just strive for gender parity because it's fair. Strive for it because it's good business. And there's a lot of statistics to actually support that. Um, recently, in the New York Times um if we're talking about government, um, you know, they reported that women-led nations are recovering faster and doing better um, than nations led by their male counterparts. Um, and then just last week, the Financial Times um, reported that for last quarter, um, women-led hedge funds beat all of their male rivals um, during the corona crisis. And so I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of other things I could cite. And I really love, I love numbers, kind of live and die by them. So I'm always, I'm always, you know, gathering uh, data about these things. But when it comes to proof and data, I really have three buckets. One is performance markers, which I just mentioned. The second one is public sentiment. And the third one is um, market opportunity. So in terms of public sentiment, I won't go into it too much, but please look up something called the Athena Doctrine, which is one of, uh, one of the best studies that I've seen about the world really desiring a female, um, a, a, like a women-led society, or at least men who think that way, either women or men who think that way. Um, and there's a, actually a TED talk on it. Um, there's a gentleman, his name is John um, Gerzima, who made the Athena Doctrine. He went all over the world and he um, questioned 64,000 people. And what he found is that feminine-led traits, which is like um, uh, empathy and transparency and things like that, are what people are desiring today, um, not codes of control or aggression or black and white thinking, which is more aligned with the way that men think. So I think that that's another really great thing when we're talking about um, gender parity, um, you know, being necessary in business. The third one is market opportunity, and I really love this story. A friend of mine, her name is Danielle Kayembe. Um, Danielle wrote a white paper called The Silent Rise of the Female-Driven Economy, um, and it explores how the majority of our everyday products and services have, uh, have been designed by men to the exclusion of women's unique needs, biology, and wants. So our world is in, is in fact male-centric. So examples of that would be um, the iPhones get bigger and bigger and women's small hands can't accommodate them. So we drop them and we actually have to get them repaired uh, more than men do statistically. Another one is that um, business, businesses um, and, and uh, you know, when you walk into a bank or you walk into uh, you know, some sort of institution, the doors are very heavy. And they certainly don't accommodate women who have strollers or small children. And it's just not, it's really designed for men. Um, a third example, and this is more tragic, is that automobile um, industry, um, they, um, uh, there were a lot of female and child deaths um, with airbags because they had only actually contemplated how an airbag would strike a male anatomy and not a female anatomy. And so I think that, you know, we need to evolve past this. Um, and a, a success story is Danielle actually went into Nike um, and she just created a motherhood line for Nike that launched last week and they're completely sold out. Um, they now have sports bras that can accommodate breastfeeding. They have yoga pants that can actually accommodate, you know, pregnant bellies. And, and it's, it's a super popular um, line. And I think we need to see more of that. And it's only going to happen if we have women at the top. Um, so those are my proof and statistics. In terms of practical implementation, um, I have um, three different approaches. One is top down, one is bottom up, and there's kind of a mid-level. Um, so for top down, it's really all about corporate social responsibility. It's something that I've really taken on um, as a personal crusade. Um, I think it needs to evolve. Uh, CSR was invented over 100 years ago, and it has not evolved um, past the point that it exists today. Um, so um, um, we're at a time in history where CSR has never been more critical for a brand's reputation, but also the future of society. So uh, big businesses have always changed the course of history, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. 
um, especially in America, but other select countries as well. Our current governing climate is riddled with political stalemates and, and government shutdowns. And for this reason, corporations have um, publicly stepped in to bridge the gap by pledging solutions to societal envir and environmental issues. So whether they come in the form of donations, funding, supply chain, things like that, um, they're, they're trying to step in for positive change. Um, the problem is that there's no data that exists after these press releases go out. And so the corporations get the street cred of being able to say they're going to do something, but the public really has no evidence that, that these things have been accomplished. And they've started to be called blackwashing for Black Lives Matter, greenwashing for the environment, pinkwashing for the Me Too movement or Time's Up. Um, and these, um, it, it's not effective. So um, I can't talk about it in detail, but I've been working with a big media partner to actually um, change CSR. And we're looking for pre buy ins from corporations um, to, uh, to start a new movement. So that's just something that I'm working on in terms of um, top down. Um, another top down um, resource would be Beyond the Billion. Um, Beyond the Billion is um, uh, led by Shelley Porges and Sarah Chen. Um, so the Billion Dollar Fund for Women began as a pledge campaign aimed at mo mobilizing a global consortium committed to investing a billion dollars by 2020 um, in women founders, um, rapidly increasing the fund pipeline. Um, the goal was met within nine months. So they started a new fund called Beyond the Billion, targeting the top of the capital stack and driving returns um, towards diversity. So I think that's another really great resource. Um, in terms of mid-level, um, there's a social club that I invested in called Albright, which is actually named after Madeline Albright. Um, and she has a famous saying, which is there is just, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. Um, and so this is a social club um, for women, but they also have a digital platform and there's extended education um, for women and they can also meet investors investors on the platform so that's a great resource um, and then in terms of um, bottom-up gro growth or um, grassroots growth as it's been mentioned here um, there are two resources which is girls who invest which was actually started by um, the managing director at Morgan Stanley her name is Seema um, and um, it recruits women uh, in college to work at BlackRock, to work at Bank of America and all these different places. And they've had a 70% retention rate um, for these women um, and they're staying in finance. And I think that's really, really important. And then I also want to give a plug to the African Tech Vision, um, which was started by BMW Ventures. So. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us that big picture. And also very importantly, what is the comparative and competitive advantage of women in entrepreneurship? Also highlighting, uh, if I may put it that way, also highlighting how making for and selling to and made by uh, and, and designed by women is, is a key to changing what you call um, male-driven uh, market models and and also then entrepreneurship and and indeed that is a very big niche but not niche I would say we are half the world so it's a, it's a very big opportunity to drive entrepreneurship thank you and data uh, I think all of those top down mid and and up and and earlier we had heard from Room Zoom about grassroots so all of these uh, ideas are very very important I now come to uh, Madan Padaki, uh, and I want to say at this point that uh, usually, especially in India, I notice manals, uh, especially in these days when we are having these webinars. But we have here uh, a woman L, if I would call it that, uh, with a he for she, uh, very capable. Um, and uh, a, a very gender supportive uh, uh, panelist, uh, Madan. And he's going to speak on uh, uh, how to coll uh, collaborate with all stakeholders on generating a mass entrepreneurship movement. Madan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmiji. And uh, thanks for uh, 
having me uh, it's privileged to be amongst uh, such accomplished uh, women and uh, laura rumjum could agree with your uh, comments and very inspired by uh, there's a lot of learning that i take back from your uh, comments as well thank you you know uh, i've been an entrepreneur the last couple of decades and uh, i come to realize that uh, job creation really happens when you spur the entrepreneurship mindset in every nook and corner of the country and uh, the work that i do at one bridge is all about how do you really create entrepreneurs in every village a few of us got together uh, some years ago and said listen uh, you know we have 150 million youth entering the workforce the next 10 to 15 years in india and uh, the corporate sector barely employs 8% 9% of the workforce in india so if we have half a shot at uh, at a chance of making sure that each of these youth who enter the workforce are gainfully uh, are contributing members economically contributing members of the indian society uh, entrepreneurship and and nurturing a spirit of entrepreneurship especially from a job creation standpoint is the only possible bullet that we have right and that spurred us to create something called as global alliance for mass entrepreneurship why do we call it mass entrepreneurship in india maybe there are two worlds Uh, the world where i live in bangalore or you take a gurgaon or mumbai you talk about entrepreneurship it's all about these tech platforms geeky guys who sit and code and it's well known that uh, the tech startups have uh, contributing the the ratio of jobs created to growth uh, is extremely low right startups uh, these startups are not about job creation it's about another economic model so uh in the other world uh, if you were to go and talk to the ministry of msme or department of industries or whatever entrepreneurs or uh, you know the self employed folks are seen largely as necessary entrepreneurs and are seen with the lens of being beneficiaries uh you know just because you had nothing better to do you ended up uh you know selling vegetables on the road or you ended up uh, you know whatever uh, starting a sewing uh say buying a sewing machine and starting to stitch clothes so the the other end of the spectrum is that it is completely necessary to an entrepreneurship and we believe that there's a missing middle right and and, and just the stats statistics are also bore out of uh, you know bear out this fact that uh, the msme sector employs about 111 million people uh, but the micro enterprises contribute to less than 6% of the gdp so it's an extremely small contribution to the gdp and uh, uh 94% of these enterprises employ less than 3 people so you can see that there's a massive skew in terms of being self employed and of course then you have the mega enterprises so the missing middle that that we identified a couple of years ago was that what will it take for us to increase the number of entrepreneurs uh, who can generate employment for 5 to 20 people each and and we call that as mass entrepreneurs uh, from two angles one is that you need these mass entrepreneurs everywhere the entrepreneurship everywhere conversation we are having how can we have these people uh, like them sprout up in every nook and corner of the country and can they deliver jobs to the masses so can can this ent- entrepreneurial surge result in 50 100 million jobs over the next 10 years so game uh, uh, you know the name goes clearly we realize that this is has to be an alliance and uh, it's only a collaborative approach that can solve this rather than individual organization solving for it uh, so our vision uh, and mission is that can we catalyze a mass entrepreneurship movement in india and eventually globally where uh, we can create in india 10 million new mass entrepreneurs in the next 10 years uh, generating about uh, uh, 50 million jobs and can 50% of them be women mm. right so that's what we've taken up as a mission uh clearly as was articulated uh the dice is loaded uh, against the women in several ways uh you know if you look at labor productivity we did a study recently where we said that if you're a entrepreneur running a business in urban india and let's say we take that benchmark as one of labor productivity the same enterprise being run by a woman in rural india is 0.2 right so you can look at look at the even if you take one aspect of labor productivity look at how underutilized uh, the levers of women entrepreneurship is and uh, we've been uh, trying to look at the uh, you know uh, the entrepreneurship angle through the gender lens and we recently did a study 
uh, across India, spoke to several folks, uh, and and then you know, I I kind of resonate to what Rumjum was saying, and that was a part of our learning as well. When we asked uh, practitioners, policymakers, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, who have kind of hit and 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 scaled it up to some extent, uh, what are the things that matter to you? The following came up. One is that. Uh, the self confidence of women entrepreneurs to take on them to take their families on and the society on to scale to start mm-hmm. to hire people a lot of women we spoke to said listen i'm doing it for myself my husband is there to support me i don't know how to hire another person and start getting jobs from them i don't think i'm confident enough to have employees right the second uh, thing which which we realized was a way to get self confidence going was the lack of role models when we asked women entrepreneurs who do you identify who else do you identify with in your community who you think is a great entrepreneur very rarely we found answers right because we have not celebrated these stories uh, enough right uh, we only talk of uh, you know uh, the tech entrepreneurs or the large scale entrepreneurs but we never recognize that this lady who's running a vegetable shop hiring three people is an entrepreneur herself and uh, those stories are not recognized so how do we create role models that can inspire women to say hey if i can become uh, if they can do this why can't i do this the third uh, experiment that uh, the third learning and we're doing an experiment about this is that most of the women said i learned uh, entrepreneurial uh, 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 you know ways and means by interacting with other women there were no courses nothing so it's the peer to peer networks that has really spurred uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, resilience and agility so in bangalore we are doing a, an, an an experiment of around uh, 12 weeks to build peer networks in local suburbs mm-hmm. of women entrepreneurs and we are measuring over a 12 week period how their own perceptions of themselves the communities and the opportunities have changed we are actually in the middle of the uh, initiative now and happy to share that we are seeing a massive impact of just speaking to women half an hour in a week together and just sharing stories they go back much more energized and and i think we have underestimated the power of peer networks which is probably the reasons why sgs have worked uh in 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 very very effective ways as well the the last part about uh, this is the digital divide that how many women don't even have access to a feature phone and the feature phone really belongs to the man of the house and they get to use it uh, during their you know uh, when when the man of the house is not using it so how do we equip them with digital skills and digital access to be able to tap into the world and to grow and scale faster uh, in fact we are doing again a workshop uh, mode uh, process in bangalore uh, for women entrepreneurs to equip them with digital skills and again we're seeing some very interesting signs of uh, 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 you know responses and growth that we're getting So this really becomes at the at 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 the level so at an ecosystem level I'll ask the question what can we do together uh, yes. to bring these to fore how do we how do we work with the system to create more peer learning networks how can we celebrate entrepreneurs women entrepreneurs day in and day out in every possible channel that we can get and how do we increase access to digital skills uh, these are some of the initiatives that we're working together at game and uh, you know I'd love to figure out a way of collaborating with each one of you Uh, as we embark on this journey to to make this uh, womanal that is there more an except more a norm than an exception <laughs> thank you thank you madam thank you indeed uh, you have raised a uh, very very uh, key issues that when i was with you and women we were also very right. much focusing on um, one uh, how do you move from necessity entrepreneurship to uh, a, a higher of of job generating and larger job generating entrepreneurship and also the question of the missing middle and uh, you have also talked about and that's the essence of mass entrepreneurship as well and you've talked about the importance of storytelling role models success stories all of that we have found that on the ground as well uh and uh, the fact that uh, we have to overcome some of the key uh, barriers which is digital literacy financial literacy yeah. business skills confidence uh, and the social uh, support exactly. i think the social network uh, also is very very important and uh, of course uh, you've also highlighted this uh, very important aspect of peer to peer learning and uh, how uh, that is 
you know, a, a game changer uh, for uh, uh, a ma developing a mass entrepreneurship movement among women. So I now go on to our next speaker, uh, Gulnar Puya, who's going to be focusing on closing the gender gap in uh, the emerging technologies area, but also what are the kind of educational and skill uh, related steps that need to be taken uh, also to ignite entrepreneurship in this area? Well, you have to yes, thank you very much. And thank you for all the insightful, insightful comments, everyone. Uh, given that we're running out of time or we've almost run out of time, I will try to make it shorter. But I'd like to very much focus on, uh, if I may, in, the, in a short time, on how do we actually motivate, motivate women in developing countries to become entrepreneurs? Not that if they're entrepreneur, how do we help them? Entrepreneurs, how do we help them scale? And I'd like to talk about that from the experience of uh, Seven Gates Ventures, to which I'm a strategic advisor. Uh, Seven Gates Ventures is on a Can the Canadian government startup visa program. Through that program, they're uh, able to bring entrepreneurs and four of their teammates to Canada to expand their businesses. Um, uh, Seven Gates has had extremely great experience bringing entrepreneurs and women, if you will, mainly from the Middle East, in fact. Uh, and now strongly believes that the very strong curriculum, uh, you know, school curriculum in those uh, in those regions and so, sort of the gender relations make these entrepreneurs very resilient for startups. So um, so what I'd like to focus on is how do we actually help create more entrepreneurs in these regions? Um, you know, I come from that region myself. I've seen the evolution of diversity and inclusion. Uh, in corporate America or, or around the world, really, and we really have come a long way, but we have a we still have a long way to go, and we need to, we 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 really need to be pushing for the next phase of our uh, 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 of our evolution. And what I'd like to focus on is really is the you know a new lens and new approaches to education. So how do we tackle? How do we orchestrate an effort between NGOs, corporations? Uh, to start that education at a much, much early age. Um, if I go back to some of these regions of the world, believe it or not, that they are still being taught in school as part of the school curriculum that the woman's main job is actually a household chores. Um, but despite all that, I mean, if I look at my country of origin, Iran, uh, even though that's part of the skill, skill, uh, skill curriculum and part of the culture, 50% of women, uh, uh, university students in some of the most prestigious uh, engineering universities are women. And I believe, uh, uh, so, so despite all the challenges and, and, the, uh, and what um, institutions are trying to create, women are thriving. And I believe that's because of, the, of access to information that really started with the internet revolution. And I'd like to quote something um, from Bill Gates. Decades ago, he said, and I quote, we're all created equal in the virtual world and we can use this equality to help address some of the sociological problems that society has yet to solve in the physical world. So I really do believe in that statement, but I feel we have a long way to go to capitalize on the opportunities that technology advancements present. So if you think about cloud, if you think about mobility, if you think about blockchain, um, we now truly have a more connected and accessible world. So how do we leverage this connectedness to further promote um, um, entrepreneurship, to further promote women? And if I may get a little specific in some of the efforts that I've been a part of uh, uh, as a um, as extracurricular activity, if you will, uh, some targeted campaigns of successful women really to showcase that it is possible, the art of the possible, that it is possible to come from a region of the world, from the Middle East, and still create impact at a local and global level. Targeted campaigns to bring those examples, to bring examples of new and simple business models that are now possible with these new platforms. Um, I'll give you an example. My kids 
are now taking, of course, because of COVID, are taking their Spanish classes virtually on a platform and they're being taught by teachers from Guatemala. You know, our entire life changed and now they have daily classes. Teachers are teaching in Guatemala. They're taking Farsi classes on another platform uh, from a teacher in Iran. So, you know, there are the, these, these, um, these are very simple business models and it's truly because of the advance, advancements we've been making in technology and we continue uh, uh, making. So providing those examples uh, in campaigns will really uh, ignite new ideas in, in the, this, uh, uh, you know, for these smart women out there that uh, just do not have access or might not be exposed or might, not, might consider, uh, you know, taking a venture like that very risky. Um, it'll ignite ideas and it'll, it'll um, motivate them. Now, how do we, how, what can corporations do? I mean, that education cannot just be done by NGOs or, and, and many of these governments are not even interested in, uh, in, in uh, driving these educational programs. Uh, so I, I um, again, I have a few ideas, but I'd like to make sure I leave time for Aritya here. Yeah, so yeah. I'll yeah. give two examples here. One is uh, corporations can really make these platforms more accessible. They can create new platforms that enable the, you know, inter new, these new interactions, these new transactions um, um, and that, that, and that can allow these entrepreneurs to scale their ideas more rapidly. And I'm not proposing that corporations do that for goodwill or charity. There is actually significant advantage, business advantage for corporations as well. And then the second area I would, uh, I, which I truly believe in as, as, uh, uh, because I live it on a day to day basis that we really need to be thinking about the workforce of the future. There are many industries, uh, enterprises in many industries that are paying significant, uh, making significant ex expense, uh, investments in upskilling the workforce. Um, mm -hmm. their, their workforce is aging. They cannot upskill people fast enough. And they are genuinely challenged. So why not start? These corporations can start investing in educational programs to train their workforce of the future from an early age. And as they take on those initiatives, um, while they are recruiting, if you will, their workforce of the future, they're educating a big chunk of the society. And some of those young kids will end up being the, um, you know, the entrepreneurs of the future. And on that, on that note, I actually think those educational programs need to be more focused on technology and the power of technology and how and the applications of technology. So that way, both the society benefits because you're training, uh, you know, training young children, really starting then and corporations benefit because they pay significant uh, um, costs for recruitment, for retaining, for upskilling. And it's a, it's going to be increasingly a challenge. And if and I may just wrap up with one last comment, because I feel like it's uh, uh, this discussion will not be complete without bringing up a very fascinating woman who's on the news at the moment, uh, the notorious R RBG or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who truly fought for equality all her